Today, I'm going to be talking about Philogernica, which is a mural inspired by the original painting by Picasso called Guernica. So a little history um, about Guernica. Guernica was painted in 1937 by Picasso. Originally, he was going to paint a picture of the inside of the studio, but uh, at the time, he learned of the bombing of Guernica in Spain during the Spanish Civil War, and it moved him so much that he decided to switch gears and actually paint Guernica. Um, Victoria, can you put a picture of Guernica on the screen, please? Thank you. <clears throat> so, in this painting, give us a second, we'll, we'll have the painting pulled up for you. Okay, so in this painting, basically you see the aftermath of the bombing. This town was a strategic town in World War II because any soldiers that were retreating would have had to pass through this town. So it was kind of, Worth, it was worth bombing it, but it was actually quite stupid at the same time. Most of the people were out of town, but there was enough people there to be killed and for all the atrocities you see in this painting to happen in real life. Um, the painting, interestingly enough, has no color. It's black and white and gray scale, which for Picasso was kind of a departure. He had done drawings in black and white before, but a painting this size that was in black and white, this is like probably the first one. He actually went and had paint made that had a matte finish to it so there'd be no gloss and that the light would die on the painting itself, which was also a first one. Um, if you look at the painting, you can see the woman holding the child on the left-hand side. You see the light bulb and the, the, the picture takes place inside of an interior, um, which is also strange. So, this is a war painting. It's a depressing painting. It's a painting that deals with death, destruction, war, all of those things. Uh, what he saw, his, his, the way he saw what was happening around him at the time. So kind of like Goya, who never saw uh, the, the destruction in the war that was happening in other places, he painted things that he could not see. And Picasso kind of did the same thing here. You have to remember, this is the time really before uh, cell phones and cameras, you know, camera photography was just coming into vogue and there was no way to really see anything physically in your face. So the, you had to use your mind's eye to envision what had happened. And that's what Picasso did. That's what Goya did before him. So Picasso kind of got that from Goya, who was probably the, the world's first uh, newspaper painter. And what I mean by that is they would hear about something that happened and then they would articulate it visually. And that's what Picasso did with this painting because obviously he was not there at the time. Um, so this place was attacked by the Nazi German Condor Legion. And there's, you can read about it and it'll tell you exactly what they did. They started with regular bombs and then they moved to incendiary bombs, which would burn the structures that were already uh, bombed out. So it burned for a couple of days, I think two or three days after it was uh, burning. Um, when Picasso painted this, uh, he had the help of Dora Maar, who was a photographer at the time. So as you can imagine, everything she was photographing was in black and white. There was no color photography back then. So her helping him paint this massive painting, it's a very big painting, it's huge, 25 feet long, I believe. Um, in and of itself was like her being a photographer and helping to paint a picture that she was gonna later take a picture of in black and white. So it photographs really well in black and white. Um, and if you really look at it, you can see in the horse, he used washes of color. You can see solid blocks of color inside the arm. There's other areas of the painting that are just solid, solid color where Picasso was making a statement and, he, and these shapes and these, all of these things that you see, little, little shapes and little sketch. You can see that his hand is, is very prominent and he is articulating what he can't see, what he's imagining happened in real time with, with his, his hand, which was at this time incredible. He has, to me, he has one of the strongest hands ever in the history of art, if not ever. Um, and these just look like haphazard sketches 
and you know, back to what he was doing at the time, it was, uh, it was avant-garde to paint in this fashion. Everything else before him was a measured type of painting. It was, uh, it was, it was uh, illustration. So it was very line heavy, talking about things before, him, before he started changing what painting was. Okay. Um, so I want to go, I want to give you guys a little background on Fuligernica. So Fuligernica came about, and can we go to the first sketch? Okay, this is my rendition of Guernica. Okay. Um, in your mind's eye, you can see what the original looked like. And this is my version. So in the middle, you'll see we have the bell. So I replaced the eye with the bell. And the reason I did that, it was, it's the focal point of the painting, the light bulb, the eye, and I wanted to bring attention to that. In Philadelphia, the, the Liberty Bell is a, you know, a central point of what democracy is in this country. So I wanted to, I wanted to incorporate the bell, which is Philadelphia specific. And a lot of people don't know that Philadelphia was the capital of the United States before Washington, D.C., they moved it. So it's very important to note that as far as democracy is concerned, Philadelphia is uh, considered, you know, the, the Falcon's Crest, so to speak. It was the beginning of it in this country. Um, to the right of it, you see Benjamin Franklin, who's also Philadelphia, and he's ringing the Liberty Bell. So I, I included him because you can't really talk about Philadelphia without talking about Benjamin Franklin. Uh, he's part of the history of that city. So I definitely wanted to incorporate him into the design. Um, originally, uh, we'll go to that picture later. Okay, the other elements. The love on the bottom right of the, of the sketch. This is the original sketch before it was approved to be turned into a mural. Is a Robert Indiana sculpture that's also in Philadelphia. It's, you can't separate Philadelphia from that sculpture. It's part of the city. It's a thing that uh, people come from all over as tourists to see, to check out. And it's one of the things I definitely had to incorporate. And also, you know, the Picasso painting was all about death and destruction. I wanted this to be a happier painting. Um, I wanted it to be uh, something that changed the way this, you know, Guernica was viewed. And I wanted it to be a spoof on the Picasso. I didn't want it to be exactly like what he did, which would, you know, is impossible because he's a master and I'm not. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to include uh, other voices inside the actual painting, the finished painting itself, okay? The hands up with the heart face, which I can't even see on my screen, is if you look at the original, um, the original had this, uh, the hands up, but it was a scream. So I wanted to change it. It looked like a man being eaten by like a, like an alligator or something like that. And uh, I wanted to leave that, but I wanted to make it something even, you know, something happy. So that's why I put the love on it. Um, you'll see the window uh, above uh, the woman, and that window is also in the original uh, Guernica itself. So I left that element intact. I wanted people to see that. Above the Benjamin Franklin is a brick wall. Um, I've left that element. One of the things that I took liberties with was to put the American flag behind Benjamin Franklin to actually uh, it's, a, it's, it's a, one of the square elements in the original Guernica, in the original painting. And I wanted to keep that in there because it breaks up the space. It breaks the divide space inside the picture plane. And it's a very important tool that I wanted to integrate that I didn't want to lose from the original drawing. Another thing that I kept from the original um, is the foot breaking the picture plane and going into the, the far, farthest bottom right hand side of the picture itself. Um, I left the foot there because the foot in the Picasso painting was barefoot, but I wanted to leave it because it's, it, it makes the eye go to the, from left to right. It's an important device inside the actual painting because had Picasso not put that foot in there, that would have been a dead space and it would have been what I call an eye magnet. But he was too smart to make eye magnets. Everything is very balanced and 
everything is very pyramid-like in its structure. Um, from the foot all the way up to the eye, it's shaped like a pyramid. And you can see the lines in the original and uh, the balance is, is just perfect, like everything that he did, perfect balance. Um, so you, you have Benjamin Franklin pulling the bell, then you have this kind of like B-boy that I put on the bottom holding a radio and he's holding a microphone up to the Liberty Bell, kind of asking it a question, you know, ask like we're, we're always doing in this country, asking a question of liberty, you know, how, what, what are the benefits of democracy? What, what, do you, what is democracy going to do for us? And, you know, when you ring the bell, the, the ringing of a bell, you know, bells can't be unrung. You know, when you ring the bell, he, you know, Benjamin Franklin is ringing the bell and he's making a statement as far as democracy. And now the B-boy underneath is actually saying, you know, what are you saying? Like that. So that's kind of what I did with him because in the original, you see uh, the face looking up towards the, the eye or the light bulb inside the room. So I, I didn't want to lose that element of the original. I wanted to have his arm thrust up and I wanted to have Benjamin Franklin's arm kind of looking like the face that was coming out of the doorway. And I didn't want to lose either one of those elements because they make up so much of the integral part of what Guernica truly is. Okay, the eagle um, is Malcolm Jacobs, who was, I mean, this guy, I don't know if, if anybody follows the NFL, he was amazing. You know, when all of the, uh, the Kaepernick thing was going on and uh, when, you know, all the social injustice was going on, he was a loud voice, he was a prominent voice, and I wanted to pay homage to him because he means so much to the city of Philadelphia. Uh, all you Eagle fans out there, you know, you love him. I know he doesn't play for the Eagles anymore, but you, you know, you, you can't wait till he's a free agent so he can come back to you guys. Uh, the thinking man, the thinking man is Rodan. Um, I added him because he's, you know, that's a, that's a sculpture that's everyone seen that all over the world, at least once when they were a child, they learned about it. They see little miniatures of it. It's, it's a, it's an, an, a good eye magnet. And, it's been seen everywhere. You can't name a country where uh, the children haven't been taught about the sculpture. Uh, probably one of the first of its kind. It's a big giant bronze, it's in Philadelphia, and it's actually in the front of the Rodin Museum. A lot of people in Philadelphia drive by it every day and probably don't even you know, recognize or realize the significance of that sculpture in the art world, in the art canon. So I wanted to include that. Um, resting at his right leg is uh, the Mummers Parade. So the Mummers Parade came under fire uh, in the past for wearing blackface, things of that issue. So I integrated it and in the final uh, design of the mural itself, you'll see that I put the black power fist in there. And I did that on purpose. Uh, read into it what you will. <laughs> but there was a reason behind me doing that. Um, the bridge, of course, is, is, is also integrated. And then the sunbeams is, like I said, you know, the, in, the, in the original, there was really no light in this painting. It was black and white. And the, the light was coming from that light bulb. It was the only light in that room. And uh, I wanted to make sunlight come into the painting, not actually in the painting itself and, and, and having it illustrate, you know, light. But I wanted to be happy and show that there is some good in the world. Um, Victoria, can we go to the, to the, of the, the first uh, image of what the students help me with? Okay, so this was the original sketch. I'll go over this really quick. This you really can't see anything. These are just my hand drawing real quick and just trying to figure out where things are and just, just a light sketch. So there's no face on the B-boy yet. You see the face with the, uh, the the arm reached out, extended, ringing the bell. You see the eagle, everything is just raw right here. And I do this as an exercise to figure out where things are, and then I work them out later, um, which they'll probably teach you in art school. Uh, and basically, it, what happens is, when you do this, you, you see all the mistakes you make, you know, and that's what Picasso did when he did Guernica. He did probably about 50, 60 sketches. I don't know how many there were, but before he rested, on the final design. And the sketches are super, super, I actually like the sketches better than the finished painting. I always like the sketches. I, lo I love underpainting. I'm a big fan of underpaintings. 
I'm a big fan of things that are not done, that are not refined. I think like the rawness and, and the truth in the art is found inside the, uh, the elements that, that are coming straight that you're expressing, even though they're not refined from the beginning. Um, can we go to the next picture, Victoria? Okay, that's, that's a close up of uh, the hands up, the MLK. One of the students helped me design. Next picture, please. Okay, so this bird, um, this bird was uh, drawn by one of the kids in uh, NET. So these kids were under court supervision and basically they have a center for them and they, uh, they report there every day. Some of them are, I think most of them are on bracelets, they're under court supervision. And what I challenged them with was, hey, I'm gonna design this mural and you guys are gonna help me with the design elements. So this kid drew this bird and it's so simple and strong and beautiful, a bird with an upturned bill. It, I love it. I mean, if I had a t-shirt with it, I guarantee you, a screen print of this t-shirt, people would ask you all the time, who did that, who did that? That's how strong it was. And he laughed at it when he did it. And I was so adamant that he respect what he had done. Even though it's simple, it looks like it's simple. These types of drawings, when you're doing them raw like that, they are super complicated. You think that it's just a couple of lines, and it's not. The lines have a relationship. The upturned bill is saying something, you know, in his mind. And I wanted to integrate. I did integrate it into the final uh, design elements of Philogernica. And I'm going to have this thing framed. I've said it before. I love it so, so much. I'm probably going to screen print it, and I'm going to keep it. I just, I think it's super, super powerful. And like I said, the, the line drawings are the genesis of all paintings, the genesis of illustration, and it's important that the children learn the importance of line drawings because they should know that the, the, your first expression is the most powerful expression. Everything you do after is just refining uh, which your original thought was to put down on paper. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. This is an eagle that one of the children drew. And I mean, if you look at it, the lines look simple, but there's a lot going on here. Um, you see the, the representation of feathers, of what they think feathers look like. Of course, they have no bird in front, so they're, they're drawing from their mind's eye. It, you know, when you draw from your mind's eye, it's raw, it's personal, and it's super, super powerful. These, these kids are doing this, and they're sketching these things, and it's only taking five minutes, and that's really all I gave them to do it. I had them exercise and, and use speed. And the reason why speed is so important when you're executing these things is if you start overthinking the image, you'll ruin it. And I, don't want, I didn't want them to think too much about what they were doing. I just wanted them to draw and just have the freedom to draw and the freedom to express themselves. And a lot of these images, people say, oh, it looks like, they, you know, they don't know art. If they think these are not complex. These are complex drawings, not architecturally complex or mathematically complex, but they're complex because of shape relationships and the speed that they're executing. Next slide, please. Here's another eagle. And this is a little bit more illustrative. The bird's a little bit more angry. But once again, this is just with them with no images, going from just their, their mind's eye, their memory of what an eagle looks like. And this was a day, every day that, that, I, that they attended my classes, I would have them do a bell, an eagle. Some days I just had them just draw. And they were totally engaged. They loved it. And these are the images that they came up with. Really, really quick, really heavy. Uh, if you see the bottom feathers, he knew to make that. I didn't teach them how to do it. He just did it on his own. He knew the bottom would be heavier. And then they knew they had to fill in space under the eyes. So th these are, you know, children that are exploring their artistic ability um, right in front of you in real time. And it's amazing because they don't know how good they are. And I had to keep reminding them. They think that it's a simple simple sketch and I can't even draw like this. That's the funny thing. <laughs> like this, this is something that I, it's, this is a, a, a stretch for me. It doesn't, my brain doesn't work like this. So to see a, a child be able to draw like this is astonishing. I love it. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this one I really love. And I, just think about the power of this. Power is all evil. Seeing is deceiving. That's so poetic to me. And it, 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 this wasn't, this didn't make it inside the final design, but I thought I should include it to show you that how a child sees us as adults in the world. Power is all evil, seeing is deceiving. And I mean, to me, 
I, I just, I love, the, I love the rawness of that and it's, the truth in it. It's very true. And, uh, you know, this is them expressing how they see the world. And us as adults, we should be listening to these things because they, this is going to be their world when we leave here. And this is how they see the world. So it's, it was a great exercise uh, for them and for me to, to see, you know, what this place feels like and seems like to them. You know, whoever heard of seeing is deceiving. I've never even, <laughs> I've never heard anybody say that before. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay, this is one of the bells. Um, the, same, uh, the same young man who did the bird design also did this bell. His name is Tahir. And uh, like I said, it's just, a, it's just a raw, loose illustration of a thing they can't see in front of them, but they know exists because they've seen pictures of it before. They've seen depictions of it. It's the same thing going back to Picasso, same thing going back to Roy. Things that they've seen that they don't have in front of them that they can actually draw and articulate from their memory or from what somebody else told them. In this case, it would be from just probably from elementary school and you know, the history of the city that they live in. Next slide, please. Okay, here's the, this, is the, this is the prototype for the other bird. This is before he filled the building. This was just a shape and a thought. This is, you know, raw, like I said before, just raw. You see the hump in the head, like he kept that when he did the second one. He knew he wanted to upturn the bill, so he curved it more on the, uh, on the second one. But this was the original, you know, when you have that eureka moment inside of yourself when you're drawing something, you say, hey, you know what, this is interesting. And then he refined it more. And then he stopped. It didn't need to be refined anymore. It was just so strong. I had him stop after that because the next thing you know, it gets overdrawn and, and it becomes ruined. And I didn't want that to happen. So that was the, uh, the prototype for what I call the Tahir bird. Um, next slide, please. Okay, this sneaker is just like totally, this, this child does not know who Philip <laughs> Gustin is. <laughs> I, I really highly doubt that he's ever seen a Philip Gustin, but then they do a Philip Gustin without even trying. Just, I mean, literally, when I saw this, this is the first artist that I thought about because it's so, uh, the hand is so prominent in the, the drawing itself. It's incredible that these children do this. And, you know, Picasso said it, they, you know, they paint all their lives to paint as children again as adults, you know, when they get older. And no adult as an artist should ever lose this ability. And there's this, this sneaker is so complex. I look at it from the art world perspective. You know, for, uh, people say, well, why didn't he, you know, if he drew the sneaker exactly as he saw it in his head, it'd be boring. If it was just an illustration of a Nike, we've seen that 10,000 times. But he took liberties and he thought about it and he said, what does a Nike look, think, look feel like to me? You know, he put the air on it. He put, you know, it's disjointed. It's, I just, I mean, I love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. I just love the shoe, the, the, the laces, how many there are. It's, you know, the number is not correct. You know, AF1 on the back, on the heel, just the ankle doesn't fit inside the sneaker. And then just the lines above, the, the, you know, the Nike mark are amazing to me. How he did that. And it wasn't a straight line. He went and just, you look at that, how jagged that line is and just un it's the whole thing. This is what drawing is about. This is what expression is about to me. And this sneaker was, I, I wanted to incorporate it, but I really could It was so powerful that if I would have incorporated it exactly as it was, it has the, there's a danger that this will take over the whole composition. That's how strong it is. Next slide, please. Okay, another bell, just a loose drawing that, you know, one, two, three, done. And they know that the crack goes in the middle of it. So they don't try to put the crack uh, in where it's supposed They just know that it's there. It's in their mind's eye. They're putting it where they assume that it goes, which is what they did here. Next one, please. Okay, this is the finished mural itself. Um, so as you can see on the right-hand side, I want to start there. I put two of the Tahir birds, as I want to call them, uh, in the corner. And I love, uh, I love these birds. I love the way they, just the way they look. And I just, I wish I could just did, did a whole bunch more of them, but I didn't want to unbalance the composition. Um, 
the Benjamin Franklin is cubed out a little bit. I didn't want to do his face exactly. All I need is the suggestion of who he is. I don't need for the uh, for it to come off as just totally painted, painted, uh, and just illustrated to the point where it's it's his face. I want the suggestion of his face. I want you to say, "Oh, that's Benjamin Franklin," and then that's it. There is no need for it to be totally uh, photographic, which is not what I was going for. Um, I kept him grayscale like that to make him pop and come off of a flag. Uh, the flag, I had assistants help me paint this whole thing. The, the only thing that I really, really spent time on was like the flag because uh, it was such, it's such a flat area of space. I had to give it dimension uh, through tonality and through shading. So, so I spent most of the time in the flag and maybe the wings, but my assistants, they, they were amazing. Big shout out to them. Um, the belt, as you can see, was designed by one of the students. Uh, all I did was add the shading and the color, but the top half of the belt, where the belt actually hangs, it was 100% drawn by one of the students. The eagle with the football, I took one of the eagles from the children, and um, I actually put the Super Bowl trophy inside of it. I had to integrate it because that's another thing that's important in Philadelphia. They finally got a, a Super Bowl win over the Patriots. And I wanted to keep that in. And of course, Malcolm Jacobs and uh, on the Eagle to break up space. And then on the bottom left, you see the Mummers Parade, the banjo with the Black Power Fist and 1915. This is actually their logo that they use. And I kind of wanted to send this, I wanted them to see it and be like, okay, because they're part of the city too. And you know, they make mistakes and hopefully uh, this will help them rectify the mistake. And then the thinking man, of course, who's another Philly icon, like I stated before, it can't be overstated, you know, just another Philadelphia icon. And of course, everything is still in the inner room the way it was. So it's interior and it's exterior. Uh, the other element, people probably miss the mountains, you know, Pennsylvania is a beautiful state mountains. I wanted to put that in there because it's not just all city. It's, it's also uh, the, got the whole rest of the state, all the counties surrounding beautiful, beautiful counties. Um, what else? Let me see. Um, the, the sneaker, like I said, in the foot, which was important to me to add to break the picture plane and then the key. His spine is curved with the belt. So a lot of things happen inside the picture plane that are done just for aesthetic purposes and reasons to, to, to have your eye be trained to go where I'm directing it to. Even the slats, the louvers, where the light is coming through, those are all uh, design elements that try to stay true to what Picasso was doing originally. Um, it's in no way made to be, to compete, which no one can compete with the master. It's just made to, uh, to pay homage to him and to involve and to have something inside the city that is about the city itself, which was really important to me and designed by the inhabitants, the children uh, that inhabit the city. So they can drive by it and say, hey, I designed that bird. Hey, I designed this, I designed that. And hopefully it'll be there for years and they'll be able to drive by it. And it's a part of them now, it's a part of their history. Okay, is there any more slides? That is the last one. That is the last one? Okay, well, you wanna open up for questions? Anybody wanna ask me anything? Definitely, let me. I see one Q&A. We do have one. It says, fabulous mural, love the colors. The mood seems more hopeful and joyful than Guernica. Not sure if you said why, but why did you choose Guernica as your model? Because it's my favorite painting ever in the whole world. I love it because uh, to me, it was the first piece of graffiti that was like, I'm not going to say commercial, but it was the first piece of graffiti art that, and at the same time, it was like a newspaper article, all wrapped up inside one. So for me, the painting has uh, triple, so many meanings into it, and I love the size of it, I love the scale of it, and I love the conditions in which it was painted. So this guy's painting this, and there's like bombs going off, um, you know, and people are dying all over the place, and I wanted to... Uh, I just, I love that art that's created during strife. That's why it's my favorite painting. Anybody else? Okay. 
Any other questions? When looking to create my own Guernica, when looking to create my own Guernica, how do I start selecting objects to put in there? I mean, objects that have meaning to you, um, obviously. Uh, I would grab things that have personal meaning, is what I would do. I picked things that were specific to Philadelphia uh, because that's what I had in front of me. So if you live in the countryside, let's say, whatever, and uh, a blade of anything that's in your immediate area, you can incorporate. You know, it could be things that uh, people can't see, only you could see in your mind's eye. So like I was saying before, it could be things that, that are important to you that you that never witnessed firsthand, but that you're integrating into your drawing. So as far as objects go, like I said, importance and relevance to you, and then just stick them in there. I mean, you have the freedom. It's, it's a blank piece of page, just like your life. You can do whatever you want with it. Any more? Yep. Um, do you Zoom with schools? Somebody is loving your work. Just reach out to me and uh, if, you know, it's, uh, Victoria will share my email, and then if I have the time, if it fits into the schedule and we can work the schedule around, definitely not a problem, not an issue. I'm open to that. Another question is, what would you say is the mood and or message of your mural? Just to, just to lift the depression um, from the original mural, because the original mural is depressing to me personally, and it is to thousands and thousands of people. Um, I want the mural to be seen as a, a, a collaborative effort between me and the children and the city of Philadelphia and mural arts um, all together at once uh, when people consider it. I don't want it to be uh, the type of thing where it's, it's really has no, it, it's, it has nothing to do with me. It's all about the city uh, and I keep it like that. You know, I'm just an antenna, so I'm not really the artist. I'm just the person who take, you turn the radio on, it grabs the frequency and then hear music and that's what I try to do I just try to tap into the frequency and then present whatever it is I grab from the music. next question is why did you not include the eye the seeing is deceiving in the final mural and sometimes you got to be subtle um, and you know I don't want to be that confrontational I do that in my own art practice and I didn't want to involve I didn't want to make the kids code offense with me because you know, there's always, me personally, there's always the, uh, the desire to go hard and to do all of those things. But I thought that it made enough of a statement. Um, maybe I'll use that piece in a later, you know, with that statement in a later piece of art. But I felt like uh, everything that I needed to say in this was already said. And uh, I didn't need to, to bring that more to the front. But there'll be a time in the future when I do. And uh, when you're dealing with organizations, when you're dealing with the public, you gotta be, you know, you kind of be on an even keel. I don't want to be too confrontational. I'd rather just come in smooth and then later on we can do heavy impact. Can you tell us a bit more about how you talked to the students about Guernica? Very carefully. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, they're under court supervision, so they're already mad at the world. So I'm a representative. I look at it as somebody who's good, who's trying to help them. And I didn't want to uh, ostracize them more from society than they already are. I feel like uh, they not coddle them, but I needed to, I needed to show them a, a, a certain period of time and what was happening in that period of time, and then kind of link what was happening with Guernica that was happening in their current life. So when I showed it to them, they were interested. You know, they wanted, they really don't, they weren't too keen on what was happening in World War II. I don't know what public education they had as far as uh, art history and world history. So I had to like kind of tread lightly and see where they were with that. And uh, they kind of knew a little bit who Picasso was, but they didn't really know the history of that painting. So I had to break it down to them and make it where it was, uh, it was a type of thing where it, they were being introduced to it. So now if they want to, you know, it make them interested in it and then maybe it'll be four years from now, five years from now, they'll investigate further and they'll remember 
the class and remember what everything was about and then they'll go back and they'll research it and then my job is done. What are some of your favorite Philadelphia murals? Oh man, there's so many. I like the one on, which street is that? I don't know the streets. The one with the girl, with all the little murals around it, I love that one. That, that one is just amazing to me. With the long hair, I like that one. I like, uh, who's, of course I like the, um, what's his name, the Shepherd Fairley, which is on the other side of my mural. I love the red in that. I love the, the illustrative lines in it. I like those two, and there's another one with the, uh, the one that Jane likes with the girl. It's all blue in the background. That thing's incredible. And then there's one on the side of a building of an apartment complex that is just crazy. I can't believe the scaffold. I wish I would have saw it go up. Those are like my three favorite in the city. Did you ever consider putting in any reference to the Trump presidency in the mural? The Trump ex-presidency? <laughs> No, I didn't. I, I try to stay away from politics, um, especially with, as far as children are concerned. I didn't want to involve them in that. Um, that's a grown-up school. We need to fix it. We shouldn't put the weight of that on them. So basically, uh, I kept him out of it. We never discussed Trump. Uh, I, I didn't, you know, I try to keep the politics out of the art itself. Um, in my own art, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll attack. Um, that's just, that's on me. But I didn't want them to have the stigma of uh, making a statement and then it coming back on them and say, these kids, you know, this, what is this adult doing? So I have to be careful because I'm still kind of like new to this. I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to make it where I'm trained, where somebody can say, hey, I'm training these kids to be lefties. You know, they'll, they'll start labeling lefties or righties or whatever it is. They'll, you know, they'll just, they'll put an ism on them. And I didn't want that for them. They, they haven't got time to work that out. Um, we need to fix what's going on right now. And then they'll figure it out for their next generation. So I want to leave them the freedom to do that. I don't want to try to, I don't want to train anybody. I think they should just observe and think for themselves. Could you tell us a bit more, a bit more about the two exhibitions that you're currently featured in? Um, making, oh, marking yes. time and rendering justice. Okay, so marking time. Time is, is uh, curated by Dr. Nicole Fleetwood. Hello, I hope you're watching. I love you, sister. You are the best, you're the greatest. And it's at PS1, where I currently am right now. Um, excellent exhibition, over 40 artists. Um, that's one. The other one is at African American Museum in Philadelphia, which is online only. You can view that. The link is on, it's on my Facebook page. You can see it or you can just Google it and it'll come up and you can do a virtual tour. Uh, so this show is up until April 4th, and I'm not sure about the one in Philadelphia, but it should be up, I think, until the springtime. I'm pretty sure. What's next? What projects are you working on, and are there any collaborations on the horizon? Um, the next, I'm going to be doing large screen prints. I'm going to be uh, doing a bunch of secret squirrel stuff, things that I can't really say anything about. Uh, collaborations, I'm always collaborating with other artists on the down low. Uh, inside my collective, Jesse Crimes, Roberto Rivera, uh, James Ho, uh, also uh, Russell Craig, you know, where we kind of throw ideas off of each other all the time. And they'll, if I paint something that's bad, they'll say, what are you doing? And then they'll stop me. And then I give them feedback on their stuff. And it's like, it's like being in Jedi Council. I can't lose because if one of us does something that, that needs to be critiqued, We'll stop the other one and it makes us stronger so um i'm just i i really never know what i'm gonna do i kind of like uh i wake up and i say what's today what, what am i gonna do today i don't ever uh have a, a preconceived notion of what the art is gonna look like i i kind of i just try to be an antenna for the time i don't like to uh project what I'm gonna do. I like happenstance to come in. You know, if something happens, I'll say, oh, let me do something that addresses this issue. And that's it. I don't ever know what it's gonna be. I don't ever try to steer what it's gonna be. I don't believe in uh, being mathematical about art and saying, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna draw this, and then doing it like that. That doesn't work for me. It may work for other artists, but uh, you know, knowing myself, 
the art is never about me. Um, it's not even made by me. But I'm just an antenna. The art comes from some other place. I'm not. Uh, I'm not the guy who's uh, taking the credit for the images that come that are done. It really has nothing to do with me. It's outside of me. Um, I hope that answered your question. Next. What is the advice that you would give to young and up and coming artists or aspiring artists that have yet to find their voice? I would say paint, draw. If, you're, if you want to be an artist, do it a thousand times and screw it up a thousand times. So you may see an image that, that I did and you don't see the 888 other images that I destroyed trying to get to that one image or say that one thing. So don't get frustrated. Just keep going. There's no, there's nothing to be scared of. Don't worry about, I don't paint for the public. I do what I want to do. I don't paint for an audience. So don't ever paint for an audience and assume that I'm going to paint this way and this is the person that's going to like it and this is the person that's going to buy it. Shed a symbol all about it. You know, you just do what you do and, and if you freak, if you keep doing it frequently, the rewards will come. Just don't stop. It might, who knows how long it will take you. It'll take you years. I've been doing this for years and years and years and years before I even, I've been doing this from inside prison and I'm doing it after. So you're looking at over 15, 16 years of me just constantly making art. And I mean, when I say making art, if I stop and draw on the napkin, that's part of the 888 uh, images that I told you it took me to get to one. If I, if I doodle on a piece of paper, that's part of the 888 images it took me to get to one. If I make an origami, something out of a napkin, that's part of the 888 that takes me to get to one. So just never stop, just keep creating, and then you'll find the path and you'll find your own voice. And usually, some, most of the time, it'll come from someplace else and it'll guide you and tell you what to do. Uh, don't try to steer. That's like the worst thing you can do. Don't try to be, I'm gonna be this artist or I'm gonna be that artist because the universe will screw up all of your plans. Everything you think that you need to be doing, the, the universe will come in and say, not happening, brother, you're going this way. So the best thing to do is just be like part of the, in the sea and just let and just go with the wave. You know, if you try to go through the waves straight, you're gonna capsize. Next question. That was the last question that came in. Does anyone else have any further questions? You're getting lots of love on Facebook. Thank you. <laughs> Marla loves the gems that you're dropping. I can't see. <laughs> I'll see you after. All right, that looks like it. Any, oh, here we go. Was it easy or hard to engage the young people in art? I think it was easy. I mean, because think about their lives. They're like literally, um, they're being told, not, not told what to do, but they're, they're in a system and they're in a system that basically uh, that has structure. They're, they're in a structured system. So they need to be unstructured to be free to create. It's hard to create inside structures and substructures. It's easy to create when you don't feel like you have uh, the state telling you what to do. So what I do with them is I basically, I just tell them, look, whatever you're here for, whatever your, your situation is, we are just going to work with here and now, you know, and they need that space. They need to be free in that space to not think about why they're there, or why they, they, not that they have to be with me, why they chose to be in this class and to learn something different. So I don't like them to be, to feel as if this is being imposed on them, so to speak. I wanted to feel like, like they decided to do it. It was just a decision they made and, you know, come hang out like that. I try to make them my partner which is the best way to do it. If you try to teach at somebody, they'll deflect them. You should teach with them. You should both be learning at the same time. I, I, I truly believe that if you teach at somebody, they become defensive. And these children are already defensive. They don't need to be defensive. They need to feel like, you know, this individual is with me. He's my partner, we're on the same team. And that's the only way it's going, education is gonna work properly. How do you maintain your wellness as you make a lasting impact on our young people? My wellness? Woo! 
I try to sleep, which I don't get a lot of. <laughs> um, it's difficult when you're busy. You know, the schedule as an artist is hectic. It's a, a Zoom right now and then a Zoom later, and then you've got to go show up over here. And it's, it's seriously busy, and I fall off. You know, I try to stay healthy, drink disgusting green things and, you know, whatever, stay away from the coffee and alcohol and all of those things. Uh, eat a little healthy. Um, I should be healthier. Um, as, and as far as being mentally well, um, I'm inside. I'm artistically crazy, so they'll never, that'll never happen. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's, as far as wellness is concerned, it's very, it's super, super important. Of course, obviously, if you're not well, you can't do any of this. So, I mean, I'm always teetering on the edge of wellness, and you know, I just make sure that this is intact. My physical body, whatever. Um, mentally, I try to make sure that I am focused on the mission again. Excellent, thank you. That seems to be the last question that's come in. Okay. Any final remarks then? Just keep making art. Um, it, like I said, if anybody wants to reach out to me, I guess go through, go through Mural Arts and uh, we can work something out. I know we're getting ready to go on lockdown. So it's Zoom Nation right now. Uh, and uh, yeah, it does. I can zoom from anywhere. We can teach from. We can set up workshops. We can do all of these things. So just reach out, and we'll figure it out together as a team. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Jared, and thank you, everyone who has been able to join us today. Have a wonderful afternoon. Yeah.